Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Welcome to summer. Fortunately, we are sequestered away in this beautiful air-conditioned space where we're going to be tantalised by all the speakers today. First of all, I would like to acknowledge that we meet today on Wajak Noongar land and to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the original owners and cultural and spiritual custodians of this country. My name is Ted Snell. I'm the Chief Cultural Officer at the University of Western Australia. It's my great pleasure to invite, to, to welcome you, <laughs> all three, to welcome you uh, to this uh, symposium, Art Cargo, which is, as many of you will know, because you've been sitting in the audience of the previous um, symposium, um, the uh, Undiscovered, which we held also on the University campus in 2014. And for those of you who love these events, and clearly you do because you're all here this afternoon, you can to know that there's going to be another one next year. We're going to link up with the High Tide Festival uh, in Fremantle and have our first uh, event off, camp off this campus anyway um, in Fremantle. So that's in, I think, October, September? September. September next year. So keep that in your diaries. This is a collaboration between Art Source and the Cultural Precinct at the University of Western Australia. Uh, and it's a really fruitful one, and we're hoping that it will continue for a very long time. Okay, well, as you know, today you're just about to become um, enveloped in a whole series of discussions about how travelling and trading has impacted on the way in which the visual arts have been developed in Western Australia. This, of course, is a very good time for this conversation to happen. There are four, at least four, exhibitions at the moment that are exploring just these ideas. Uh, it's the 400th anniversary of the Dirk Hartog bumping into Australia. Dirk bumped into Australia in 1616, so 400 years ago, and we're celebrating it at the moment with major exhibitions. I hope you've seen the exhibition at the Rhodes Wilson Art Gallery called Saltwater Mapping. If not, you'll fortunately have the opportunity to see that over drinks at the end of the day. Down at the Fremantle Maritime Museum, there is the exhibition Traders and Travellers, which the um, museum has done in partnership with the British Museum, which is fantastic. Uh, John is going to be talking about his exhibition, which he has um, uh, curated at the John Curtin Gallery, Invisible Cities. <coughs> and there's also Unknown Land uh, at the Art Gallery of Western Australia. So there's a whole lot of information there which forms the, the frame, really, around which this conversation is happening today. But we are going to range very widely. We have some fantastic speakers to talk to you this afternoon. And firstly, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce probably a man who needs no introduction, John Matia. John is a poet, a curator, and a writer, as I'm sure you all know. He was involved in the South Project, which was that fantastic project which is having many, many spin-offs and continuing to. Uh, which began in about 2000, I think, John, 2002, sometime around then, um, looking at the way in which the whole Southern Hemisphere might be seen as an, another sphere of activity rather than just always the Northern Hemisphere. In 2012, John was the Australia Council initial inaugural artist in residence, uh, writer in residence in London, and while he was there, he organised a, a program called The Global Does Not Exist get a bit of an idea about what he's going to be talking about today. Uh, in 2013, he curated In Confidence, Reorientations and Restart at PICA. Uh, and during that uh, event, he also organised a symposium called The Am Ambiguity of Our Geography. As I said, his exhibition that he's curated at the moment is at the John Curtin Gallery in the Small Cities. Please get along to see that. But right now, it's your job to welcome, most welcomely, John Matthew. Uh, I just 
we should begin by like a reality check. Uh, this, this, this is a, a boat that I saw in the Cocos Keeling uh, Lagoon, and Cocos Keeling Islands are between Perth and Sri Lanka. Uh, I asked people, uh, where did this, uh, what's the story with this boat? Um, and I asked several people, many wouldn't tell me, it was in the lagoon for quite a while. Then eventually someone said, oh, that was a pirate boat. I said, what do you mean? They said, oh, well, some pirates uh, got this Sri Lankan fishing boat, then they sailed it to a different part of Sri Lanka, got Tamils from the north of Sri Lanka, people smuggled it, people smuggled them, and sailed into Australian territory. Uh, the boat was impounded and is held there, or was held there. Um, the, the, the cargo, arch cargo, uh, was sent to Christmas Island, and the pirates were sent probably to be hung in Sri Lanka. So this is uh, three year, two or three years ago. So that's sort of the geography that we're in, that kind of extreme geography as well as that kind of beautiful poetic seascape. Um, I think we just need to think about these things because there's the politics of that, there's the reality of that, uh, but there's also the invisibility of that, which is what those detention centres are about. They're about retaining a certain political invisibility. Uh, but container ships are also about certain invisibility. I mean, all of our goods arrive that way. It's hard to it's hard to realise that almost everything we buy comes in these boxes that we see glutes in through mantle. So there's that invisibility as well, that commercial invisibility that Dirk Hartel was actually part of, and that a lot of what goes on here is part of as well, that kind of exchange. Uh, so what is that in a world of the people who are the cargo, of the things the artworks, the objects that are the What's the invisibility or visibility of those things, that inner world? Um, so, so this is, this is uh, I don't know if you knew, so In Confidence was a show I curated for, um, for Pika uh, three years ago. Uh, this is one of the works in the show, Max Pam, who I'm sure most of you know. Um, I wanted to begin with this. I'm not going to mention all the names of the artists in the show, uh, but, but I, I, I selected Australian and international artists. Um, Simran Gill, for instance, is an artist who, who, who is seen as mobile. She's seen as an international artist, as Australian, but also as Singaporean and also as Malaysian. Um, Rodney Glick, who works now in Bali. Uh, so there's a mobility within the artists I chose. I won't go through all the names, but it was very much about trying to uh, create a show that was international, but international in relation to the space we actually occupy, rather, interna rather than international in a sort of a London or New York sense of international. Um, but this picture, I think, speaks of this question of invisibility or the, uh, the inner world. Like when I see this guy wearing a t-shirt, we recognize one of those faces and you think, well, what, what is the inner world that he resides in that makes him want to wear such a t-shirt? Like, what is the meaning of that? But not only the meaning of that, what's the imaginative geography in which a picture of a Son of Ben Laden on a t-shirt makes sense? Because it makes sense in different parts of the Indian Ocean region, for good or ill. Um, so Max captured that, as sort of four portraits. Um, Then, again, a similar thing, this was used as, um, for those of you who you know the show, Pinker, this was used in the publicity. Um, this was used in the publicity of the banner, I think it made a relative image. And basically, um, like, I thought this was an interesting image. It's based on a, uh, a Taiwanese traditional sculpture. Um, uh, for those of you who have seen it, it's more or less life-size, it's slightly less than life-size, uh, solid wood. Um, and again, to me, it, it makes an interesting parallel with the, with the fellow wearing the t-shirt. Um, and some people said to me, uh, they said, oh well, as, as Asian Australians, they found it quite difficult to accept that as a work. They felt it was like um, appropriate, appropriate, kind of cultural appropriation of the Asian image. And I said to them, well, first of all, um, how clear are you that that man is, that is an Asian face? That's one question. Secondly, when I see that, I think of Superman. <laughs> you know, so there's, that, there's that, that other way of reading the images. And so the question is, when you look at these images, to what extent are you reading like an image in a, a socialized, agreeable way? And to, what, what, to what extent do, do your personal readings of works actually animate the meanings of the work in a powerful way? 
Because I think that's what art always does. It's always moving between inner and outer worlds. And there's a kind of a various kinds of politics in that. This is the work by uh, Pankasila, uh, which is a group uh, from Georgia, um, the key figure of whom is uh, Daniel Kesminis. And, um, and they basically began as a punk rock band. Uh, but in Georgia, uh, most people do many things, uh, paint as well as play in punk rock bands. So they made all sorts of things, as well as deciding to make their own guitars. Um, and so this is actually a work of three guitars of different kinds. Um, and this work by Lin Lu. Uh, Lin is, a, uh, is an artist from Singapore originally, who basically works in, in, in England, uh, mostly in London, and, and is very active on the performance scene in Europe. Uh, she trained in Japan, uh, and actually she was um, she was mentored at one point in Japan by Koji Hamada, for those of you who remember the Pika show back in 1992. Um, so, so again, there's another mobility there to do with Southeast Asia and North Asia and also the UK. Uh, this work is, is, a, is, is, is a video work and that's a still In the performance, she and her, her now husband uh, are exchanging like a noodle. I always think of this like a noodle. Um, a, a, a French poem that's written on that ribbon. And the entire work sort of consists of this exchange that sometimes leads to a kiss, sometimes leads away. But to me, it looks very much like eating noodles. Um, so that's kind of very sort of localized and down to earth. Uh, and this work uh, is by Tom Nicholson. Um, this is one part of the series that was shown in the Kika show. Uh, it consisted of a video, it consisted of documentation and several bits of photo documentation. Um, you can see. I hope you can see it, it's quite small on the screen, but there's, uh, uh, the, there's a group of students moving down the street. This is the center of Porto in Portugal. And they're looking at a leaflet. That leaflet is a reproduction of the propaganda leaflet that was dropped over East Timor by the Australian troops when they left in 1943, abandoning the East Timorese peoples of the Japanese invasion. Uh, the other part of the work is a reproduction of the leaflets um, and a video of, of two airplanes flying over Porto with the first and the last lines of the text trailing above the city. So again, localised, Australia, Southeast Asia, but then also internationalised, Portugal, uh, through a kind of a, 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 an international style of conceptual practice. Um, um, so, and the other part of, of, of these, these projects, and as I go through, I'll mention it, is actually the texts I write, which are, I sort of sneak them in as catalogues, and there's catalogue essays, but often the text is doing something quite different to what the show is actually about. So for that exhibition, uh, called In Confidence, um, I stress this question of what is confidence in art practice? Like, what is it to be sure of the thing you're making and the meaning it has? Uh, for the essay, I address the ideas of uh, George D. D. Huberman, where he talks about the question of the confidence that exists in the writing of art history. So for the actual catalogue essay, I was addressing that very particular conjunction between the surety of art history and history writing, and the ambiguities of and subjectivities of one's actual experience in making the account. For the show, um, in confidence suggested to be the question of secrecy, which I think is key in some of the works. This question of what's a personal space and things intimate to it, like Lin Lu, or what's a political space and secrets that exist within it, like in the Tom Nicholson. So, um, So this is the project that I did with um, a Space 2 Future Recall, Marco Marcon's sort of large venture. Um, and it was exhibited in the two places shown there. Uh, this, this, this has quite a bit of complex history, so I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of it. Um, um, when, when, I, when I was asked to, to think of a project, um, I was thinking of like, what would be localised within rural or remote parts of Australia, and what would be international in a way that was of interest to me. And I remembered once uh, being in Catani uh, for the ex exhibition of the Karala painters um, in the early 2000s, and, and seeing how many Malay people were in the 
the town. So I was quite fascinated by this. So I nominated Katani, and knowing a little bit about the Kokas and the lay people there, thought this would be very interesting. So I went down there and then started to um, ask the people um, and ask the people about their, their history, their own knowledge of their history. And soon I realized that I'd have to systematically visit quite a number of people because everyone was giving me a slightly different account of how come they came to Katan. That wasn't too bad. But how come they come to be on the islands, the Cocos Islands? That was the thing where there was a big discrepancy in terms of uh, the, the local knowledge and the uh, community's knowledge of their origin. And so I went and I interviewed many people. I show this image uh, first because this shows you what uh, one of the uh, interviews house looks, house looks like inside. So you can actually see like just how much you feel transported to another world when you're in Catan, just by stepping through a doorway. Um, one of the interviewees showed me this um, when they were explaining to me their, their legal status. Um, they explained that they weren't Australian until a particular point in time, the late 70s. The very complicated history. But they said before that, um, they, they, their births and deaths and marriages were recorded by the Clooney's Ross family. And they showed me uh, this birth certificate. And that's the register of one of the John Clooney's Rosses. Um, and many of the people I was interviewing I interviewed, or can only read Malay in Jawi script. So what struck me was actually the quality of and the power of the elegance of that signature versus the actual difficulty of writing for people who haven't been taught to write or who are writing another script. This whole question of textuality. Um, so I, I, I started investigating this further, and, um, and when I got to the Cocos Islands, the imam there gave me um, a number of texts, and this was very, very fortunate because these were texts I didn't know the existence of. Uh, a few were published books, but some were manuscripts. One was a PhD, an MA thesis from Canberra. And as I read them on the islands as quickly as I could, because if you've ever been there, you know it cost a lot to stay there, so I could only be there for two weeks. So I had to read everything as quickly as I could. And what I realized was that actually uh, the, the people on the islands, the Malay people, the forebears of the community who are there now, had been brought by someone other than who they thought had brought them there. They'd been brought there by Alexander Hare, who was actually at one point a colleague of the first John Clooney's Ross. John Clooney's Ross then, by various processes, took control of, of, of the people and the island and retained the island until the, the early 80s. Uh, this picture is from the end of one of the large islands, which is the most in, in, inhabited island where the Malay people live, called Home Island. And that small island there, which looks very different in different photographs, is the island uh, where Alexander Hare last lived with his so-called hiring of Cocos Malay slave women. And I kept looking at this thinking, what was the story of that? How could you end up on this tiny part of the island, which is thoroughly impractical to stay on? Um, what was the logic of that? And as I, as I sort of contemplated it, it became clear to me that the only way to actually explain that, that period of competition between Alexander Hare and Clooney's Ross and the exchange of possession of the Malay people who were there was through a narrative. There was no other way to do it. And I wanted to do something that when I did it, it would be absorbed by the community themselves. They might find problems with it, that's okay. But in general, I felt that I was actually there as a kind of an intellectual laborer for them because I was the person able to access archives. I was the person to, able to read all this material and bring it together um, and, 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 and consolidate it in some way. So I thought the best thing to do would be to actually uh, narrate, to narrate the episodes of the most significant events that took place at that time, which ended up being eight episodes. And I produced this, this book which, um, which contains the text I wrote um, and, um, and the Malay translation. And we also made a translation in the Jawi script uh, so that those people in Katanning and elsewhere who can only read the Jawi script, Malay and the Jawi script will be able to read it. Um, and that's sort of in process now. This is the last um, sort of stage of, of the project so far when we presented the book in Katanning Art Museum to the community. And this lady came down from, from Perth. In fact, she bought 30 copies of it <laughs> for all of her relatives. 
Um, and she's there reading the text in Malay to the audience. So th this is the current show, um, Invisible Genres, which, uh, which directly uh, touches on um, touches on the Dirk Hartog anniversary. Um, it's got quite a complicated uh, cu curatorial sort of logic, so I won't go in, into that in too much detail, except to say that um, we placed a Dutch artist's work in the centre of, 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 of the galleries, literally, but also as the central work of the entire show. And the reason for that is that, um, is that her work echoes certain elements of Dutch painting, which came, which sort of flourished here during the period of the Dutch Golden Age, which s sort of follows, follows the period after which has of landed here. Um, in the video, which I'll just describe very quickly, this gentleman reads a text um, by an Indonesian nationalist, which is called If I Were a Dutchman. The text itself is very interesting uh, because he's actually speculating on his political rights if he wasn't an Indonesian and if he, as, if he were a Dutchman, implying that they need to change the politics such that he can just be an Indonesian and doesn't have to want to be a Dutchman to have power. He's a, he's a famous rapper in the Netherlands. Um, uh, the, the film proceeds through, through, through him reading the text of various people on the balcony discussing it and concludes with this scene, which is actually the artist's daughter singing uh, inside the vast space, which is key to the entire work and to my exhibition, because that vast space uh, looks like an empty cathedral. And as you might know from art history, uh, the empty church painting were, were actually a kind of painting, a kind of genre of, of Dutch art in the Golden Age. And that was because the Protestants emptied the churches of images. And when the Protestants emptied the churches, the churches of the images, they forced, uh, they forced the painters, who had previously been happily occupied working to the church, to reconsider their occupation. Can they continue making principally religious artworks? And so what happened was they, they, they actually, in general, moved north, uh, the ones who wanted to be Catholic moved south. They, the, and the ones who moved north, these are the artists of the Dutch Golden Age. And they began secularizing their work. And through the process of secularizing their work and making smaller works for a more affluent audience, they were able to basically start mass producing artworks. So over the course of the century, they think about a million paintings were made in the Netherlands. Um, and through the process of specialization, they created what we now recognize very well as genres of painting. So my show is based on this, this moment where the religious space is emptied of images, and then it leads to this proliferation of secularized images. And so in the show, we, we, we use, we have that work as the key work, and then the other works are selected according to their elements of, of genre that they represent. So the four genres, portrait, landscape, seascape, still life, and artworks of the everyday. And I use those four principles to select the largely Australian art that's in the rest of the show. But we also <coughs> have some South African artists and the, the Indonesian artist, uh, Mopo, uh, to retain a sense of the geographical connection uh, you know, that Herzog was on when he bumped into, as Ted said, bumped into Western Australia. In that process, I uncovered some very interesting works. Uh, this work I have known of for quite a while. This is a painting of the Bali bombing. Um, so, 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 so it occupies a very strange place in terms of the logic of genres. In, in a one way, it's an everyday scene. Like it's the street in Bali, just was blown up by a bomb. It's a historic painting because of that moment. But those, those symbols, those whirling sort of starlight symbols, are images of sacred fire. So even in the midst of the everyday, in the midst of that horrific historic experience, the Balinese reinstitute the spiritual presence as kind of a corrective. And so throughout the show, there are these moments uh, that actually contradict the secularization that I think comes from, comes from that Protestant moment of clearing the church of images. And what it does is it makes 
Australian and Western Australian art look very different when you're starting to look for these relations instead of looking for the usual ways we systematize uh, contemporary art. Uh, this work is uh, one part of a game which is a board game that uh, PV Art Collective created in Bloemfontein, uh, South Africa. Uh, it's a game where two players play and uh, as they play they are asked to do various performances in kind of competition. In this one, this step of the game, uh, the one player asks the other to stand on the milk crate and adopt a pose for a certain moment. And the pose automatically objectifies the person, but it objectifies them, according to the logic of the game, into a kind of a utopian pose, a utopian image of the future, an image of possibility. So it becomes a kind of a portrait, even though this is really something coming out of the everyday and the streetscape and game playing. Uh, this work as well is, is, is of course in the show, and this, this work by Julie Dowling, uh, when I think of the word cargo, I do think of this lady. She was uh, Julie Dowling's great-grandmother, who was named Melbourne, uh, worried about Melbourne and Inky. Melbourne is Melbourne, after her husband, and I would say that provisionally, uh, named her after his favourite city in Australia. Uh, he took her to, to exhibit in England uh, as, as kind of cargo and uh, with the money he bought a house in Perth. Then he decided after they had a child that he wanted to exhibit her and the child again in England. Um, and at that point, you can only imagine the discussion, uh, she decided to go back to country. And so this is the scene that Julie's created. I don't know if it's meant to be before or after that period. But it's her own country uh, in what Julie calls her, her Delacroix period. So you can see certain stylistic influence. Um, and, and for me, this, this again, uh, when you're looking at the works in terms of genres, in a way, Julie always makes portraits. So I was looking at her work in terms of portrait. But of course, in Australia, uh, an Aboriginal person on country as a portrait is a landscape. So those Western genres and their conceptualizations automatically start breaking down when you start looking at the work and their logic and what it means in this place. And uh, I should say just before moving on that we are working on the book for that show. Um, it will contain two essays, one by Albi Wattel, a Dutch art historian at UWA, who's going to be writing about that period um, which precedes the Golden Age, which was the period of iconoclasm when there were the attacks on the churches. And I'm going to be writing an essay um, in relation to the uh, Italian political philosopher Paolo Bruno, uh, talking about the virtual and how the virtual uh, as a category shapes the actual. Because I think uh, not only is, is this an exhibition that uses categories and shuffles the categories, but it's also an opportunity to think how can we theorize that Way. To conclude, um, this is one of the works I, I, I discovered, and for those of you who haven't seen the show, I'm only showing you one, but there's quite a few in the show. Um, uh, and this is by an artist from the Kimberley, Big John Dolan. Um, I don't know, do any of you know him? So I'm fair in saying he's, he's obscure. Um, he, he created um, a, a genre of his own, of stone heads, which his community basically also produced. Uh, he was asked by an elder who had been visited by a spirit in a dream to make some sculptures that would represent the spirit. After he had done that, he started making heads just out of the pleasure of it. Uh, and his other people in the community copied him and Lord Elders to make up buy and like them, so he started buying them. So you actually had this industry of stone head making which appeared and more or less disappeared. Um, and in the show curtain, we've, we've got the widest selection of the heads that have yet been collect collected and displayed. I think the last show in which there was a group of the John Dodo heads shown together was about 20 years ago in Adelaide. Um, but in terms of this theme of, of this, this conference, I mean, this is a very good paradigm of how artistic practice occurs, coming out of the dream space, the spirit world, the hidden world, enters the material world as a commissioned object, gets mass-produced, and then when it's not bought, it disappears. 
So I think that's kind of a very interesting encapsulation, encapsulation of not only the art industry, but a metaphysics of our place. Um, and I wonder, you know, could it be part of 